Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars, and today I've got a car from a private collection, not Auto House in Naples, which is the usual fare. Uh, you may know I did a 77 Grand Prix a few days ago, and uh, this is a sister car to that in the same collection. Uh, I, you know, saw and heard about it when getting the Grand Prix, and uh, being a bit of a Firebird guy, based on a Firebird being my first car, uh, this was going to happen. <laughs> I mean, if it had to happen at gunpoint, uh, this was going to happen. Uh, this is a 1974 uh, Pontiac Formula 455 uh, equipped with the SD 455 Super Duty. Uh, that is the key to this whole car and, frankly, the key to this video. Uh, the SD 455 was a very, very special engine uh, that came out uh, from Pontiac in 73 and 74, right at the height of, uh, well, the height of the beginning of the malaise era anyway uh, when these sort of things were really frowned upon uh, not just by the you know federal government the EPA that sort of thing you know, the general public was starting to uh, be turned against muscle cars and uh, of course GM management uh, was not that interested in making a stand so uh, it really is a testament to the car guys at Pontiac at that stage, not the execs, not the top guys, but you know the engineers, the uh, uh, the guys down the chain who really made this happen. Uh, very, very impressive stuff. And you want to talk about rare? Uh, there were only about twelve hundred or so, you know, almost thirteen hundred SD engined F bodies made, and uh, in seventy four, uh, only fifty eight formulas got them. So uh, this is one of fifty eight, which is a ridiculously low number for a General Motors product. I mean, that's more like a, a Bentley offering or something. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, but uh, build it, they did, and uh, the car has become a bit of a legend. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to do a big overview of the F, or, sorry, the F bodies. Uh, yeah, we'll get into that as we get more of them. So I'm just going to zero in here. But uh, very briefly, uh, the F body came out in 1967. Uh, it was built on the X platform, which was a compact platform. Uh, they you know, stretched it and made it a little bit more sporty. And the reason uh, GM did that was to compete with the Mustang, uh, which had come out in 64 and a half and turned out to be a fantastic success for Ford and, of course, Mr. Lee Iacocca. Um, so, uh, you know, GM wanted something to compete with it, and uh, they needed a pony car, and a pony car they got. So uh, they it started by developing it for Chevrolet, and it became the Camaro. Uh, as a consolation prize to Pontiac, they also gave them the F-Body. Uh, I say consolation prize because what Pontiac really wanted uh, was a two-seat sports car called the Banshee. They'd been jonesing to build it, uh, but GM had decided that it would eat too much into the Corvette, and uh, that uh, was not acceptable to them. So uh, to keep Pontiac happy, they threw them the, uh, the F-Body, and uh, Pontiac started building the Firebirds. Uh, that a recycled name, mind you, Firebird. That was on a yeah, series of concept cars uh, in the 50s and 60s for GM. Uh, you know, like the Mustang, uh, it, God, the, I tell you what, I just don't have... <laughs> I don't have control of my brain half the time. Anyway, like the Mustang, not all of them were pony cars. Some of them, some trim levels are classified as muscle cars. Uh, I mean, when you have a, you know, 427 powered Camaro, you can't really call it a pony car. It, it has become something else. It's, uh, and certainly a 429 Cobra Jet Mustang is no longer a secretary's car. Uh, so uh, the F bodies and the Mustangs do tread into muscle car territory and get classified as such. Um, some, yeah, yeah, there's always debate about everything in the car world, and some expert types uh, consider this, this 74 uh, SD-powered F-body, to be the last real muscle car, and they extend the era of the muscle car. Uh, I don't know, call it what the first GTO, uh, even, I mean, there were muscle cars of sorts well before that, but uh, what we consider the modern muscle car era. So let's go from uh, 1963 through 
through uh, 1974. And if you do go with those dates, then this is only because of this one car. I mean, there was no other car in 74 uh, that could be classified as a muscle car. And that is a testament to the way Pontiac fought the system. Uh, it's actually an amazing story how uh, they developed this thing. And uh, partially with a guy named Herb Adams, who uh, was quite a car guy, uh, deeply involved in Pontiac's factory uh, and factory supported racing teams in the uh, SCCA Trans Am series. So uh, a lot of guys at Pontiac made this happen. And that's without the help of, you know, Pete Estes and uh, John DeLorean, who were long gone at that point, uh, which is kind of a shame. Uh, but uh, anyway, the uh, 455 SD did come to fruition, and uh, it is just an amazing platform. Uh, the second gen F body, again, really, really my favorite, I have to say. And the reason, again, is because my first car was a 79 uh, Pontiac Formula Firebird. It meant the world to me. Uh, I thought it was just an amazing piece from the. I mean, it was owned by a drunk who had every guardrail in town, but uh, a good friend of mine, his brother, uh, air quote, restored it. You know, he straightened it out. He painted a GM flame red. It was a beautiful looking car at that point. And uh, I was uh, lucky enough to, uh, to get, you know, to get it to drive to high school. In. And ever since then, of course, all Firebirds have been uh, a love in my heart. Uh, and uh, this one included. Uh, mine actually started again as red. At, at some stage, as stupid kids do, uh, I ended up painting it yellow because I thought that was cool. Uh, but frankly, I should have just kept it red. Um, all right, so the Firebird, it was four generations. Uh, again, they started in 67. Uh, 67 through 69 was the first gen. Uh, the 70, like uh, this style, the second gen, uh, was very late to production because of a different, yeah, the, all kinds of uh, assembly issues and uh, build issues. So it came out in early 1970. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's sort of popularly classified as a 70 and a half model rather than a 1970 model. Uh, and uh, it ran through 1970, uh, no, actually through 1981. And uh, of course it was, I mean, this car was everywhere. And one of my favorite Trans Ams might be a little bit uh, not well known. And that was the 73 uh, Trans Am used by, uh, it was a Brewster Green Trans Am used by John Wayne and McHugh. And <laughs> That car had an impact on me as a kid. Uh, I uh, really wanted an early TA after seeing that, but I just couldn't afford one. Uh, and of course, I mean, it goes without saying, Smokey and the Bandit uh, really turned this second gen uh, F body into what it is today, and that is a deeply appreciated collectible. Uh, I mean, those 77, 78, 79 Trans Ams in Bandit form uh, pull insane money now in the collector car auctions. Uh, and I suppose that's because it's, of course, globally famous. Famous, but uh, they were all over TV in the movies. Uh, you remember uh, Jim Rockford, the Rockford Files? Uh, he drove, uh, it started in 74, and he drove a series of Thunder, or Thunderbirds, for the love of God. He drove a series of Firebirds all the way through 79. Uh, interesting fact, though, is even though they were essentially in a spree, it didn't look like a hot rod Firebird, uh, Rockford uh, Garner had insisted they use the formula model and just put a standard hood on it. No spoiler. You could tell that by the dual exhaust. Uh, so it was a little bit hypo. Uh, when the 79 model came out, he hated the front end of it, did not like it at all, and uh, insisted that they keep using in the uh, prior year, the 78, uh, which he thought looked a lot better. So uh, that's a little offensive to me as the guy who owned a 79, and I thought it was actually quite handsome, uh, to be quite frank. But uh, well, anyway, so 74, here it is. Uh, you know, emissions and bumpers and all sorts of stuff had come out in 74. This car was designed, the 73 had a different front end uh, without the five mile an hour bumpers and uh, without some of the emission stuff. So uh, some people do consider the 73 three uh, SD cars to be the last real muscle cars. Uh, I do think you have to throw it. You have to put in the 74s. It's the same damn motor with a couple things you can unbolt. So uh, I, I would argue with those 73 guys. Uh, but anyway, it was an incredible time to come out with this engine. Full on malaise era, gas going through the roof, inflation going through the roof. You've got the uh, Arab-Israeli war happening. Everybody's miserable. Uh, and uh, it just wasn't a very good time. So uh, 
Uh, real quickly to set the stage, uh, there was a global recession going on, uh, and widespread inflation, uh, gasoline shortages. Uh, Nixon, who was just inaugurated in that Mark III video we did uh, yesterday, uh, the, and now had to <laughs> resign over Watergate, so uh, rather than be ejected after a uh, impeachment trial. Uh, so poor Nixon had to, uh, you know, get the hell out of town. Uh, there was the rumble in the jungle fight with Ali and Foreman. Uh, Ali had been stripped of his title because of the uh, Vietnam draft. He avoided it. They took his title away. Uh, in 74, all of that was starting to be forgiven, so he wanted a shot at it again. And he fought Foreman uh, in uh, Zaire. Uh, where, where the hell did he fight him? In Zaire. I think that's the Republic of the Congo now. And knocked him out in the eighth round, and uh, the rest was history. He regained his... Uh, his title. Uh, there was the Kootenai War. Uh, <laughs> was a strange little thing in Idaho where a very small uh, Native American tribe declared war on the United States. And uh, the way they expressed it was not with weapons. They uh, charged tolls to people who were driving through the country and handed out pamphlets and shit. So uh, it became a bit of a thing. And uh, to make it all go away, the government gave them 12 and a half acres somewhere. And uh, the war was officially over. Uh, the 55 mile an hour speed limit came into effect, which was absolute shit, miserable, and uh, a way for Ohio to start uh, really fining and arresting people as driving their uh, interstate. So uh, nice. And then uh, what newspaper heiress Patty Hearst, uh, you remember that whole debacle. Uh, you know, she got kidnapped or something, maybe, by some liberation front, and man, none of it ended particularly well. And, uh, of course, India got a nuclear weapon, so thank God for that. Uh, you know, curry going around the world isn't enough. You want to have some nukes. Uh, movies, you had The Sting, you had Exorcist, you had Pepion. Uh, I don't even believe I put a French movie in there, but I did. You have Blazing Saddles, you have Serpico, Death Wish, uh, The Godfather Part Two. Murder on the Orient Express. Uh, TV, you had Kung Fu, one of the greatest shows of my youth. And when I was home from school sick, uh, if I could get like a Star Trek episode and a Kung Fu episode, I was thrilled. Uh, it was like the greatest day for me. Uh, you all said Kojak and uh, the six million dollar man who I understand could be built for like less than half of that now accounting for inflation uh, because of advances in technology and uh, engineering. So uh, he'd be a real bargain today. Uh, and then, of course, the most important uh, thing in 1974 is Posh Spice was born. So uh, all very, very nice stuff. Uh, but uh, back to the car. So it was a unibody design. Gone was the Coke bottle design of the prior generation. And in was this sort of swoopy thing, uh, which was elongated and sort of reminiscent of 50s and 60s Ferraris. Uh, the almost straight roof line, uh, sorry, not roof line, the straight angle coming off the roof line going down into the back where that spoiler comes up uh, was a really neat feature at the time and remained with uh, the Firebird and uh, all the way through the end. Uh, that was it. So, I mean, it wasn't in the first gen, but uh, second, third, and fourth, it, uh, it, it stayed there in that big round window. Uh, in 74, it was still the square window. Later on, the window in the back would get a little bit bigger. Um, with production issues, again, it was delayed. Uh, there were four models you could get. The base model, the Esprit, which was a sort of a luxury model. Uh, the Formula, which was, eh, I call it a lighter Trans Am. Uh, you know, maybe it was for the sportiest guys or people who wanted the Trans Am option at a lower sticker price. And uh, that's what I ended up with. And then, of course, the Trans Am, uh, which uh, I believe GM had to license from the SECA. And every time they put a Trans Am badge on anything, they had to pay the SCCA or royalty, so uh, SCCA was probably miserable to see Trans Ams go away in, what, 2002. Uh, that was a real shame for them. Uh, there were a bunch of different appearance packages. Uh, the 70s were kind of the era of stripes and graphics, and, uh, and none of that was lost on Pontiac. I mean, you could get a variety of different uh, decals and trim packages. You could get the screaming chicken on the front. Uh, you could get uh, badging on the side. Uh, the stupidest and most hilarious of them had to be the Macho Trans Am package, uh, which was offered by uh, 
uh, a dealership somewhere out in Arizona, Meekum or something. Not the auction guys, but uh, you know the macho Trans Am. You had to love it. And of course, that was the time. <laughs> the open shirts, the medallions, the chest hair, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but underneath all that shtick, uh, you have to uh, know that the Pontiac engineers were working hard and what they really wanted to do while every other company uh, was starting to make anemic V8s and detuned, you know, low emission type stuff and uh, horsepower going away. They said, no, no, we're going to build a giant fast motor. <laughs> I mean, it's just awesome stuff. Uh, they were going to do it to a high revving 400, uh, but, uh, you know, the whole EPA thing ate into that. So they said, okay, we could go with a lower compression uh, if we do a 455. Uh, and that's what they did with this Super Duty thing. So they took a 455. Uh, they gave it uh, a more advanced. They wanted to do a forged crank, but they couldn't. But they did give it a fancier crank. Uh, they did give it forged connecting rods and TRW aluminum flat top pistons. Uh, they also completely reworked the heads to strengthen them. Uh, they had a big webbing cast inside between the valves and uh, a much better flow rate than the standard 455. Uh, it was also set up for a dry sump oiling package, much like it would have been in the Trans Am Racing Series. Uh, I, ex you know, one of the, I, I would almost compare it to the ZL1 and the Camaro. Not nearly as radical as that aluminum 427, but really in the same vein. I mean, Pontiac delivered this thing uh, with the idea that you're going to get rid of the restrictive intake manifolds. You're going to take out the cam, which is a little bit hot, but not hot enough. And uh, you're going to do a few tweaks to put it up over 400 power, horsepower, uh, which is basically the same thing that Chevy did with the ZL1. Uh, I mean, that was just a cunningly designed car to get around GM executives to uh, create a horsepower banquet for really hungry drag racers who were tired of the Mustang kicking their ass in Camaros. So, uh, you know, same here with the SD455. Uh, as it was delivered, uh, it was not intended to stay that way. It was uh, intended for the end user to start modifying it uh, to get real horsepower out of it. And of course, many, many people did. Uh, so it was a pretty amazing thing. Thing. Uh, and man, some of the stories of that time, uh, you know, Pontiac, one of the biggest horsepower robbers in 73, or sorry, coming into 74, uh, was the EGR valve, which would recycle exhaust gases back through the engine to burn more stuff off them to cut down on emissions. And it robbed a ton of horsepower. So Pontiac figured out that they could put in a valve or a solenoid on the EGR valve uh, that after startup would uh, click, bam, shut the valve a few seconds later and essentially nullify the EGR. Uh, then they found out that the EPA tested the engines for uh, 50 seconds. So they made the electronic, I mean, this would make Volkswagen blush. They put the solenoid in with an electronic delay for 53 seconds. So it would work for the EPA testing and uh, then shut off and the horsepower would go up. I love these guys for that. Uh, but uh, the EPA, I guess, you know, a bunch of Debbie Downers. They figured that out really quick. Uh, they made Pontiac take it off, and uh, they also made them repaint the engines a slightly different shade uh, so that um, they would be able to recognize which ones were the SD. Uh, originally, Pontiac was sort of cunningly trying to sneak the SD 455 uh, through as the already uh, the EPA'd 455, you know, their, their standard one that didn't have all the hypo stuff. So, anyway, pretty cool cats at Pontiac in those days and, and a very different world, much more of an outlaw uh, society in the uh, corporate world, which is missing today, which is, yeah, it's a damn shame. I, I wish guys who built this car uh, were still around building cars. Uh, you know what? They are. I can't argue. I, you know, when, I, when a Cadillac CTS has 700 horsepower, I guess I can't complain that car guys aren't represented in Detroit anymore. Uh, they obviously are. Uh, but this 455 SD has been described as Pontiac's last stand, and truly Pontiac did fight uh, the end of the muscle car more than anyone else. And, and you know, they've always been a pretty special company. Uh, it would have been easy for them to just take the cheap route, but they had their own set of engines to compete with Camaro, their own family of uh, even the inline six, the overhead cam inline six, and they had a hot rod version of it in the original Firebird called the Firebird Sprint.
uh, not really a widely known car and uh, very very advanced I mean essentially like a Mercedes six-cylinder design with its overhead valve uh, kind of a neat piece but of course no self-proud American is going to buy an overhead six when there's 455 V8s available. Uh, but Pontiac kept it going for a long time, even all through the 70s, even into the 79 Trans Am with its 400 at 6.6 .6 liter. Uh, they sure as hell tried, and uh, God bless them for that. Uh, it was truly amazing that they uh, they pulled this off. Oh, boy. Um all right, I tell you what, let me uh, let me pause for a minute. Again, I've got my hand going to sleep, and uh, then we'll get more into this specific car. All right, that's much better. Uh, you know, sometimes you just need to have a sip of water and get your hand to, you know, cheer up before you keep going. I hear a woodpecker around. Uh, and I have to say, of all the birds around here, uh, other than those giant screaming ones, uh, the woodpeckers trouble me the most. I mean, for... They can land on your shoulder. Before you know it, they've pecked halfway into your brain or they've pecked out your eyeballs. Uh, I mean, those things are vicious, and I think it would be nice if there were a way to just sort of eliminate them. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. They fly, so they're up high in the trees, and that isn't going to be easy. If someone can think of a way, I'd be appreciative. So here it is. So this 74 SD 455 formula truly uh, and very arguably the last real muscle car. A car and driver at the time was stunned that Pontiac was able to get this past uh, not just the EPA but their own management. Uh, they were uh, stunned and very thankful uh, actually because uh, you know what a, what an amazing thing. So uh, 75, 6, 7, whew, you know remember the Mustang too? <laughs> I mean these these were not good times for domestic automakers, and uh, that also included Pontiac and Chevrolet. Uh, but the 74, so you've got this new front end uh, unit. I mean, one could argue the 73s had something over it, but the 73s didn't have to contend with five mile an hour bumpers. So uh, with the shovel nose front, I think Pontiac did as good as could be done at the time, and I think it looks great. I love the big air inlets at the bottom, the little bumperettes, and of course the uh, famous Pontiac split grill. Uh, now, formulas generally, and there goes Peter this morning. Oh, we're going to have a conference. Hold on. That was just a little update on the Western Front. Uh, anyway, most formulas, in fact, all formulas that didn't have the SD455 had twin hood scoops on either side of the engine. Uh, when Pontiac put the SD in the formula, they decided it's going to get the same shaker hood scoop that the Trans Am's got. Uh, now non-functional, which, again, the government just ruined everything. Uh, they had to rivet it closed at the back and change the air intake to a scoop at the front uh, to do away or uh, to meet these noise standards, you know, drive-by noise, uh, which uh, apparently bothered people like Ralph Nader. So, uh, what an absolute shame. Uh, but I'm glad they did keep the shaker hood because there, frankly, is nothing cooler in the world than sitting behind the wheel of one of these things, cranking it up, and watch the shaker do its thing. Uh, we'll do that when we go in and drive the car. It's a lot of fun. Uh, they also got new slotted taillights at the back. Uh, let's head over that way. Uh, it looked good with the uh, body color in the middle of them, the little bumperettes at the back. Again, you know, Pontiac did what they could. Uh, also, that uh, square window, I think, does make these cars look more vintage and interesting than the big rounded one like my Firebird had. Uh, but, uh, of course, that one was much better for visibility. Uh, this one has these uh, cherished honeycomb wheels. Uh, very good-looking piece from Pontiac. Not really true alloys, by the way. They're kind of thought of that way, but they're not. Uh, they're steel wheels with a... Uh, plastic sort of coating rubberized thing around them to make them look like alloys and man are they attractive and uh, some companies now make reproductions in larger diameters for resto mods and that's probably what I'd go with if uh, if I had one of these cars um, let me get the keys and we're just gonna start inside the trunk love the stripes down the side man did they love their stripes in the 70s Oh, God, and the interior of that car smells like my youth. All right, so we should have a keyhole underneath here, which is the pull-down 
nice and straight. So let's get that in and twist it. And uh, these things could be sprung differently, by the way, so whether or not they had a spoiler or not. Uh, you can always tell if someone added a spoiler to one of these cars because the trunks don't pop up like that. Uh, there you see the, uh, yeah, man, this is the kind of stuff. Uh, this kept weight down, but there is this really ridiculous looking uh, donut tire with the inflator uh, that uh, would get you to the next service station to get another tire. This is where, I don't know, everything just started going crazy in this time period. Uh, the original carpet's still in there. You know, typical GM build quality. They just made a piece of trim and carpet and stuck it in and helped keep the cost down. They didn't really take too much time finishing all the uh, trunk areas and such, and uh, they didn't take too much time, you know, making all the jam areas beautiful. It had all the uh, uh, sort of overflow stuff from the assembly process. Uh, but there you see the jacking instructions on the back, and uh, man, does that trunk ring a bell. Tiny little access hole. I mean, really hard to fit things in there, uh, but uh, it's big once you do. Uh, I had a couple of big woofers in mine, which, I mean, it was a big procedure to even get them to fit in. And then hilariously, it just vibrated the whole car. I mean, all you really heard was uh, vibration with just a hint of bass around it. So, and yeah, none of that worked out for me. But uh, this is where the magic is in this car, is the uh, under the hood area, which I should have hilariously figured out before. Yeah, here we go. All right, so. There it is. A slightly different color from the other uh, Pontiac 400s and 455s is this 455 SD. And uh, this was, uh, you know, those words, uh, SD 455, uh, they get the heart beating of any Pontiac enthusiast and basically any muscle car enthusiast because they are part of the, uh, the real deal. And again, head work, piston work, crankshaft work, connecting rod work, uh, these big restrictive uh, uh, exhaust manifolds, but all of that designed to come off and be easily tweakable. Uh, in standard form, it put out 290 horsepower. And remember, that's now the net figure. That is a very high figure for 1974. Uh, other cars didn't come close. And the uh, it would run a quarter mile in the 13s. If you had one with a stick that was driven by, uh, you know, a very good driver, uh, you'll get a, you know, high 13s in the quarter mile, zero to 60 in the fives. Uh, this was much more like the uh, performance figures of the late 60s when uh, muscle cars were really at their peak and horsepower was off the chart. So. Again, very well uh, done to Pontiac getting that thing out in the malaise era. Uh, most of these cars went through a automatic. This one's no exception. Uh, it's going through the turbo hydromatic uh, 400, very beefy trans. Uh, now, if it did have the stick, Oh, sorry, no, if it had air conditioning, which this one doesn't, so that actually is a good thing in a way. Uh, factory AC cars got a 308 Posi rear end, while ones without AC got a 342, uh, you know, a, a much uh, more racy gear uh, for acceleration because the AC compressor couldn't handle the... Uh, uh, the, the whipping of the belt with the uh, 342. So it got the 308. So, uh, you know, probably best off adding it. If you have to have AC, get one that didn't come with it and then add it because you're going to get a better rear end ratio. Not that you can't change it. Uh, but anyway, a very beefy uh, four row, uh, four core radiator and uh, everything just amazing here. And then you see the way the shaker hood works. Uh, this intake wouldn't have been here at all if it was a functional shaker hood. It would be getting all its air from the rear of it. Uh, which uh, maybe we can't see it with the hood up, uh, but that uh, that's where the air would be coming in in the uh, earlier versions of this car before they had to rivet it shut for noise reduction. Uh, it also had an 800 CFM Rochester Quadrajet, which is a monster of a carburetor, uh, but uh, well able to handle whatever mods and cams and uh, whatever else you wanted to do to this thing, and uh, that did not help its overall fuel mileage. That's for damn sure. Uh, you see it's got uh, Control, uh, control arms in the front with coil springs. That's mounted to this front subframe. Uh, in the rear leaf springs with the live axle. Uh, it's just, you know, the F body. Uh, interestingly, it shared... Uh, 
uh, the uh, frame more or less with the Nova and uh, also with the uh, 1970s, uh, late 70s Cadillac Seville. Uh, they, uh, you know, weren't F bodies, but they did have much of the same underpinnings as this car. And uh, it's interesting. So that's uh, why some people were able to hot rod uh, Cadillac Seville's to make them handle and go fast. Uh, there's a, f a car and driver article I read decades ago. Uh, I think it was John Ward and his badass Cadillac. And this guy had put some sort of twin turbo NASCAR engine uh, in his 77 Seville so he could be a bonsai runner and uh, go up against, you know, uh, 930s and Ferraris at the time on this crazy highway run where he could hit 200 miles an hour. And uh, it was the kind of shit that shaped my youth. Uh, Love the hole in the hood for the shaker and just, oh God, I don't know. This car brings back so many memories. Let me get the keys out and uh, we'll hop inside. All right, so big long doors, famous for sagging when they get tired, mine did. Uh, frameless glass, which was nice. Uh, typical GM build quality at the time. It had, of course, depreciated a lot from you know the early 60s and uh, even the late 60s. The 70s were starting to become a time of somewhat lower quality and, uh, and not as nice. Um, I'll give you, for instance, this door escutcheon, the pull handle here. Uh, it's, you know, plastic with plastic chrome around it. It looks handsome enough, but it's held in by one screw only. And, you know, you could move it around, not in this one, because, of course, it's nice and tight. But uh, in mine, you could <laughs> you could move it up and down. It didn't matter if you tightened the thing or not. Uh, these window cranks, mine always would wear off the gears, and they'd just start spinning loosely. Uh, the mirror adjustment would go south and funny. Uh, the door panels would start popping out. Uh, it's a testament to the preservation of this 50,000 mile Pontiac, how nice and tight everything is. Uh, mine sure wasn't. Uh, I also got huge play in my window after a while. Uh, I could wiggle it more than an inch. And, uh, you know, it ended up sort of screwing up some of the stuff up here because of the way it closed. <clears throat> and, you know, that's why in another video I got flack for saying a shitbox Firebird. And uh, people thought it meant I, I love them. I love them more than anything. But I'm not going to be, uh, you know, pulling the wool over my eyes as to what they were. They were not the best built cars out there. Uh, what they were is just cool as hell. Uh, you got these high back bucket seats. Uh, you've got uh, room for two Canadians back there. Uh, they can engage in one of those 70s marijuana-induced trysts. Uh, you know, little transmission humps, you're not fitting three, uh, drive shaft hump, whatever you want to call it, uh, definitely a four seat coupe, and then a package shelf where uh, this one apparently doesn't have a stereo option because I've got one speaker hole, uh, but every kid I knew who had one of these F bodies had two big Pioneer 6x9s back there. Uh, you got your body by Fisher panel. You've got the seats again with the high back, your three point uh, belts. Uh, this one did have the uh, Trans Am steering wheel option with the holes in it. So did mine, you know, like a lightened steering wheel with a Firebird in the middle. And uh, I think that's very cool. Uh, mine in 79 had that machine aluminum turn dash, which I thought was really cool. Uh, always uh, standard on the Trans Ams too. It would have been in this year as well. Uh, but in 73, 74, the formula, you could couldn't get it. It was not, you know, it was this uh, fake African crosshatch, uh, crossfire mahogany only. That was the only uh, uh, dash trim you could get, uh, it, which is a shame. It wouldn't look great with that aluminum turn stuff, but I guess they wanted to keep that exclusive to the Trans Am. <laughs> Uh, actually, I tell you what, before we get in this thing, I'm going to grab my bag of crap and put it in the car so we can just leave and go from there. So give me one minute. And there's the cat coming in, so we're getting out of here at the right time. Uh, he's probably trying to distract me while his friend, the bigger, nastier, meaner cat, flanks me from the rear. So I have to keep an eye out. But yeah, anyway, let's get in. I don't have to worry about him then. All right, so here it is. Here's the greatest treat in the world, from my opinion. And there's the text coming in. Watch the shaker hood when I fire this thing up. This... <laughs> I mean, until you've experienced it as a car guy. Oh my God, you're just gonna, okay, ready? I mean, that is just one of the coolest things when you crank this big high performance Pontiac big block to life and uh, that shaker does its magic and it's shaking right now. Give it a rev. It 
ducks and jabs and moves around and it's awesome, absolutely an awesome thing. Uh, again, one of 58 this car, and it did appear in High Performance Pontiac Magazine at one point, uh, talking about the rare stripe and, uh, of course, uh, the rare production number. Uh, so this is a pretty serious car, and these have become very serious cars to collectors. Uh, any of these second-gen uh, Camaro Firebirds now in the high performance models are, are starting to get really insane money. Uh, this thing at the right auction, yeah, it's, you know, could start approaching. I don't think it's quite there yet, but it's going to be at the century mark not too long. And uh, those 77 through 79 Trans Ams in the bandit form uh, are pulling way more money than uh, I ever dreamed they would. They've become absolutely unobtainium. Uh, again, you've got the dash layout here. It would have been nice if they had the factory tack, but they didn't order it. Uh, but that's where you get your oil uh, amps and water warning lights. Uh, there's your 160 mile an hour speedo. A very, very cool number to come out in the year that they introduced a 55 mile an hour speed limit. Uh, you got your lights here, you've got your washers here. This one does have a tilt steering column, which is nice. Nice horn, not quite the freight train, but not uh, to be ignored either. Uh, you've got a full set of gauges, which uh, I presume was uh, something you had to get with the SD. Uh, maybe not. I know there were some SDs made with column shift. Uh, with no uh, center console uh, because you could order it that way uh, in the non-trans ams and column shifter So that had to be pretty interesting, uh, but there you've got your oil pressure your uh, water uh, your um, oil temp uh, your what the hell is this? Oh, yeah, your uh, amps and um, we got two oil temp gates, so I, I'm thinking that's probably not exactly correct. Uh, there's, in fact, I'm starting to wonder if these are even factory. So uh, maybe not. Maybe this is all an add-on, and I'm uh, I'm losing my mind. Uh, but anyway, if it's uh, if it's an add-on, it's a pretty incredible looking set of gauges. Uh, no AC in this thing, so you just have your climate controls. Uh, nice uh, cigarette lighter again. That mid '70s giant style like the little applique on the front of it. Uh, here you've got a very nice Delco FM radio, AM, FM. Let's see if we can find anything on here. Uh, in this car and in mine, the antenna is run within the windshield, uh, which is a fantastic idea because it gets rid of the ungainly antenna outside, uh, but uh, it does make your reception shit. So uh, form over, let me pull into the shade for a minute. The sun's now coming out to ruin things. Oh, God, that sound. All right, let's see if we can tune something in. Got it. Yeah, nothing I want to listen to. Uh, here's your ashtray. Here's now. This is better. I mean, stuff will still fly out of here, particularly because it's a quick car. Uh, but at least it's angled down to give you a shot. You got a shot at it. So uh, if you put a nine mil in there, yeah, you know, I mean, unless you're really getting on it, it's probably gonna stay there. Uh, you also have a center console here uh, for more gun storage or your registration if that's what you want. Uh, but uh, anyway, a nice little spot. Mine, of course, broke almost immediately. If it wasn't broke when I had it, and the just the cap was flopping around everywhere. Uh, you know, these cars could be real turds if they were beat up, and mine kind of was. Nice set of books, owner's manuals, build sheets, window stickers. Uh, this car did come with an awful lot of uh, documentation, and uh, part of what makes it very, very collectible. So I'm gonna get the windows down. Oh my God, I haven't done that in years. Mine had cranks too, uh, but at least you could lean over and do that. Now, I mean, again, setting the stage for the 70s, you're going to have some really hot looking broad next to you in this thing, uh, out cruising around listening to, um, I don't know, what did people listen to then? The Doobie Brothers, that sort of thing. Uh, having fun and going to the drive through and then going to the drag strip uh, with your SD455. And the way you can see the script on the side of the shaker hood from behind the driver's. Uh, uh, position is just, you know, it's an experience all to itself. And I can see why the uh, muscle car era was so fun for people and why it's still so beloved today. Uh, it's uh, it's never coming back, uh, at least not in this analog sense. 
Uh, sure, we've got incredibly fast machines now uh, that are uh, absolutely muscle cars, uh, but they're so hyper stylized and digitized and, uh, you know, done and say, I guess Chevy still had the push rod for a long time. Maybe they still do. Uh, but still, there's just something special about this era. It's, uh, it's so raw. Listen to the sound from the pipes. God, getting a little bit into the secondaries on that 600. I'll do that again when we get out into the, um, when we get out onto the main road. I don't want to run over some nice woman with her dog or something. God, does this take me back. You get this long, swoopy front end. Uh, mine did have the formula scoops, not the shaker hood scoop. Uh, so I missed out on that in my youth. I really wish it had a shaker. I, would, I really did want a Trans Am when I was a kid. I liked the vents and the side of the fenders, and I loved the shaker hood, but uh, I wasn't ungrateful. I was <laughs> very happy to have what I had. Oh. The way that, and you know, in the manual cars, every time you'd shift, of course, the shaker would also uh, do its thing. And ah, oh, what a joy to look at! But the menacing growl from this 455 big block is uh, music to the ears of any car guy. Uh, yeah, I don't know how anyone could drive that. We should make all these guys building electric cars uh, drive one of these things for a week, and uh, I bet, uh, I bet things would change. That throttle's just right there waiting for you, beckoning. <laughs> this car does not like to be driven in a uh, elderly ginger manner. It really wants to be thrashed. I wish I could. Okay, so there you go. That is what made this 74 Trans Am, sorry, 74 Formula, uh, the last of the muscle cars. I mean, that's in factory trim, no additions, no cam, uh, no work at all. And when you hammer it, it screams, uh, it chirps second gear, and uh, it uh, continues on down the quarter mile in a really lovely manner. Uh, the downshift is awesome. God, does that take me back. Do I ever, 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 ever miss that? I mean, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna shut up and drive the car. Okay, I beat on this guy's high-end collector car enough for the morning, but I think you get the point. I really, really do. Uh, I'm not heading towards uh, uh, towards the shop, so I'm afraid no interstate drive. Don't know if I could bury this one at 160 anyway, uh, but I'd sure love to try. I sure would. So there it is. Again, this car not for sale, part of a private collection. Yeah, maybe someday. This guy does change around a little bit. Has a lot of fun stuff. Uh, I'm hoping to get a few more of his cars because they are awesome. Uh, thank you very much for having a look. Really, really appreciate it. And we will see you with the next one. Take care.